Hey folks, in this episode, it's all about gear rental with lensrentals.com. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. In this show, we're going to be talking about gear. And as you all know, if you're watching this show, photographers have sort of an irrational, lustful relationship with gear and the acquisition of gear. But the problem with that is that lust doesn't always match their bank account. So <laughs> thus was born a company called LensRentals.com that allows you to try before you buy or try out gear and, um, you know, basically rent it shoot with it, see if you like it, and then send it back to them. So joining me on the show to talk about that are the folks behind LendRentals.com is Drew Sakala and Roger Sakala. These are the, the father-son one-two punch behind LendRentals.com. Drew, why don't you uh, introduce yourself first? What are you doing at the company? Do they Are you running things over there now while Roger just sort of goofs off playing foosball in the back room or what, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, he's he's more important than that, but these days uh, I co-run things with my brother-in-law, Tyler Beckman. Um, Roger doesn't like the red tape uh, and all the fun bureaucracy that comes with being in charge. He just wants to play with toys. Yeah, yeah, of course. Who wouldn't? And then, so you're are you? What's your <laughs> official title over there? CEO or or what? Uh, Vice president. It's never changed. We don't we don't really do titles very much, so it's been the same, uh, even though uh, things have changed a little bit. Excellent. All right. Well, vice president, vice president. Cool. Well, so it also on the show is the man himself there, Roger. Everybody knows you, man. You're the prolific blogger and and pull no punches gear reviewer. Right. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. And that's because I don't have to do any real work. So I have time to do that stuff. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. So wait, what are you doing now with lens rentals? So you sort of you, you started this thing and gave a, gave it its life. And, and now you've handed it off and it's growing. It's still growing. Yeah. You know, I looked at the numbers and it is it is the, the numbers are up and to the right. So what's uh, what, what, what's your major role with lens rentals dot com these days? Well, depending who you ask, I am sometimes referred to as the lovely and talented spokesmodel. But really what I do is I sit in the back and I am the head of quality assurance. I do a lot of testing. Uh, no longer do, but started the repair department and kind of work with them quite a bit. Um, and blog. That's cool. That's cool. So you're having fun. You're you're having fun, and you get to you get to play with every piece of gear that shows up on the market before most of us get our get a chance to get it right. So, uh, if, for for a lustful gearhead, you're living the dream, basically, right? Absolutely, I'm living the dream. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, guys. Before we before we dive into this week's episode, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode of this week in photo. And uh, that's our friends over at WPPI. So WPPI is, if you, I mean, if you don't know what WPPI is, the Wedding and Portrait Photographers International Conference. It's coming up later this month in a couple of weeks. And uh, the WPPI, basically what they do is they combine educational seminars with uh, major industry t trade show networking events where you can learn new techniques, build relationships, all in sort of a friendly networking environment. They say that you can learn, you can build, you can experience, discover, meet, and make an investment in yourself and the future. What they did was they hooked us up and they hooked the TWIP audience up with a free expo pass. It costs $30 to get into the expo floor, but if you want to get into the expo floor, floor for free, just go to wppiexpo.com slash TWIP. That's wppiexpo.com slash TWIP, and you'll get into the show for free. So, you know, every little bit helps, especially if you want to spend that money when you get into the show. <laughs> so thank you, and please support WPPI however you can, because they are helping uh, This Week in Photo continue to do what we do. All right, guys, let's dive into the gear talk here, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of photo gear. You guys have the notes. I put together some notes that we're all sharing, so you know what I'm going to ask you here. Um, so I want to dive into you know, the, the, the thing that, that is on my mind. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have the guys here that know 
pretty much the the good, the bad, the ugly about gear. What gear is bad? What gear is good? What falls apart after ten rentals? <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> so you know, and and I want this conversation to be candid. You know, don't hold back. You know, to, to the extent that you can, just just you know, lay it on the line. What and, and if you can't answer, don't answer. But. In terms of camera bodies, you know, we all love our camera bodies. I'm a Panasonic shooter. There's a ton of people in the TWIP community that are Fuji shooters. We have Nikon shooters, Canon, everybody across the board. And I was talking to one of our members earlier today, and uh, yeah, he was saying basically there's there seems to be this sort of irrational exuberance or and I called it Stockholm Syndrome around gear. When you buy some gear, you feel like your gear is the best in the world and you want to defend it against all those inferior brands. Who's superior? There's a pointed question for you guys. And Drew, why don't you take it first? And then Roger, you can bring it up the, bring up the rear. Um, which camera is the best camera? And which camera is the worst camera in terms of durability and overall, let's say, lens rentals user satisfaction, Drew? What do you think? Uh-oh, we lost you. Your audio is gone. Did you mute yourself? I muted myself because it's raining, and then I forgot to unmute. Oh, uh, we, need the, we need the rain. That's ambiance for the location. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little loud in here with it. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, Roger's definitely the one um, that has more opinions on what holds up and what doesn't. But uh, there is no bad gear, just gear that uh, uh, is effectively priced uh, at a low enough point. <laughs> <laughs> Even the bad stuff is usually at a price where it can kind of make sense for some people. Well, the, there can be bad gear, right? But can it, can't bad gear be the gear that falls apart after it's rented 10 times or 20 times versus... And, you know, and another question, Roger, why don't you, you can piggyback on this. Is the, is the price of gear a direct correlation to the quality of gear? In other words, pro photo lighting gear is expensive, but people buy it because it lasts a long time and they know what they're going to get. Some other brands, not so expensive, they still pump out photons, you know, but should I, should I, you know, spend less money on cheaper gear for those photons or should I spend more money on pro photo or that kind of gear? What do you think? I think that's a, a good question because there is a general trend that more expensive gear is better, but it's not an absolute trend. Uh, some things are just more expensive. A lot of it has to do with what are you doing? Um, I don't think anybody should go out and spend big money on their first lighting setup, for example. Uh, you, you brought up Propoto. I'd start with you know something a little cheaper and simpler and make sure you know what you want, or how you're going to use it, how many pieces you're going to need, and then upgrade later. But don't look at that first piece of equipment when you buy a $180 light and go, well, this is going to last me for 10 years. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. But you could still learn with that hundred and eighty dollar light. You could still learn. Like I, I have a bunch of um, what do you call it? Palsy buff, you know, alien bees and Einstein lighting. And I haven't invested in pro photo gear yet. I don't, for the main reason that I don't shoot enough to wear out the lighting gear that I have. But then I also uh, know some photographers like there's a photographer slash friend of mine, Tim Engel, who loves to just go to Home Depot and buy shop lights and, do, and right. do some crazy stuff with that. And you can't tell the difference between his work and work that you see in Vogue magazine. It's the it's the same stuff. So where where's that line? Is it, If I'm a photographer on LensRentals.com and I, I'm like, OK, I want to, you know, I got some money to spend on this rental. I want to buy the best that money can buy. Should I be doing that or should I just rent something a little bit less expensive? What do you think? I, I think that's this is a little twist on it a little bit, but I think sometimes people get caught up in the hype and they spend a fortune. I see this constantly. Somebody will rent the $20,000 video camera and then put crappy lenses in front of it to make budget. Mm -hmm. Or worse than that, put it on the cheapest tripod they can get. So that's where I, I tend to kind of steer people is, keep your gear of a similar quality don't don't get the best camera in the world and then you know put a awful lens in front of it it's not going to be what you want um on the same uh, you know you don't need a zeiss otis uh, on your t6i either yeah and and where, where do you guys see and drew maybe you could take a swing at this one where do you guys see trends in terms of 
the the mirrorless wave if you want to call it the wave versus you know the standard mirrored dslrs are you saying i know you guys have rented you rent both but have is the line been shifting i'm a lay person i have no idea what the numbers look like but in my head i would think yeah i keep hearing more and more mirrorless i shoot mirrorless therefore they're probably renting all mirrorless stuff with a slight rounding error of mirrored dslr cameras or is it 50 50 and i'm completely off base what, what do you think uh, we still rent more DSLRs than mirrorless stuff for sure. Um, there's also, you know, it can be awful hard on the mirrorless stuff to um, really know how popular it is with photographers because so much of it's used for video. Um, you know, for us, I think we, we just recently did a survey, um, you know, uh, I'm kind of asked people, are you a photographer or, or a videographer? And then matching that up to the products they rented and, I mean, some of the mirrorless cameras are rented over 80% of the time they're rented. It's for video. So, you know, if you remove out all the video users, I'm not sure the percentage of people using mirrorless is really as significant as maybe people think it is. Yeah. And what, what about you? You brought up video. So what about video? What, what percentage of the overall rentals are video? And have you seen that trend go up as more and more people sort of get into, you know, distributing video on Facebook and YouTube like this and, you know, et cetera? Yeah, video is huge for us at this point. Um, you know, the vast majority of our customers are photographers, probably 75%. But video people rent a lot when they rent. So mm -hmm. um, for us, it's about 50-50 at this point. Um, but a lot of those video users are using, you know, traditional. Uh, they're using still cameras. They're using, you know, DSLRs and mirrorless for video and uh, photo lenses. Um, you know, we have tons of people just, you know, shooting YouTube content, shooting music videos on DSLR and mirrorless rigs that are just kind of lightweight and much more affordable than the uh, bigger video cameras. And and have have you guys and both of you guys feel free to take a swing at this? Have you seen with with the the, the steady increase of quality in cell phone cameras and technology? Have you seen that like when Apple releases a new new iPhone and it does all this amazing stuff? Does that impact your bottom line at all, or or is it just completely you know church and state when it comes to mobile phone or mobile photography versus proper lens you know lens on body type photography? What do you think? Uh, it, it's probably had some effect, but I think it probably affects the manufacturers a lot more than us because um, the people who exited the market for DSLRs and, and that were happy with their iPhone were probably the people who were buying, you know, a consumer level DSLR from Target or Best Buy and are very happy with their kit lens. Maybe they buy a second kit lens. Um, but they're, you know, I think the enthusiast market, the people who really want professional grade glass or want to try out a bunch of different stuff, that market's much more uh, stable and is not, you know, people, people that wanted to try seven, eight different lenses are not happy with iPhone photos. People that were happy with one lens and never really had a need to use us uh, probably are pretty happy with their iPhone photos. So I don't think it's affected us a ton. Um, but it definitely definitely has dropped out a little bit of the kind of uh, weekend warrior uh, type customer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Hey, Roger, I have, I have a question for you. So from, you know, okay, let, let, me, let me paint this picture. You have an, uh, a once in a lifetime, a literal once in a lifetime opportunity. This is sort of a take on the desert island question. You have a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to get a shot of something. Say it's, you know, you get behind the velvet rope at a, you know, a SpaceX launch or, or something like that and where failure is not an option. What what gear, what camera, let's even and narrow even down, what camera body or camera system would you take with you to shoot that once in a lifetime event? Knowing what you know and having access to every camera on the planet, which one would you reach for? You're gonna not like my answer. <laughs> I would reach for the thing that I use the most because the problem with getting the shot these days isn't the camera. It's the camera person interface. Yeah. For, for me, I don't shoot a Canon all that much anymore. But if you put me in a money situation, I'm going to go back to probably a 5D4. Because historically, I've taken more shots with that camera than anything. And I know it well. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you, so you're going to just, even though you have access to everything on the planet, you're going to go with what you know, which makes sense. And I, I, I agree because the, the, one of the main reasons I chose Lumix or Panasonic for, the, for my system is I just love the operating system and I can get around in there easy. I have, mo I have several Lumix bodies and 
they all work the same. I know where the lens is, you know, where the, the, the setting to get to this thing and all that stuff. It's all the same on every single body, and it just sort of works with my brain. Whereas some other systems I know have challenges with their user interfaces. Drew, <laughs> Drew what, about, what about you? Uh, you know, your Desert Island kit, what, what would you reach for? Uh, two of something. That's what I'd reach for. Uh, <laughs> a primary and a backup. In, inevitably, that you know, once uh, once a year breakdown is going to happen when it's you know you can't get another one. It's never going to be when there's a camera store down the street. Yeah. Um. Two two of everything for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the most frustrating uh, frustrated customer we ever get are the people who you know call us call us on a calling card from Africa because they went on safari and the 400 millimeter the IS went out on it or. Um, you know, the five before the shutter locked up or something like that. And it's like, you, you know, you spend $15,000 on a trip. Uh, you should have spent $300 more on a second body because, you know, karma, fate, whatever, it just seems to happen. Yeah. Gremlins, <laughs> karma, poltergeist, all that stuff. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So back, back. go ahead, Roger. I was going to say back in the old days when we were small and I kept up with things early on, we had 15 people who rented a lens to go to Africa and their own camera failed on the safari. That was probably in our first four years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. 15. I, I, I think it's first four or five years, but I, I kept every one of them because most of them would, would call and just be some miserable and some going, is there any way I can get a refund? My camera broke, which, well, I couldn't help that. It wasn't our camera. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. There's so many stories that I want to I want to get into with you guys. I know you guys probably have like horror stories that would just blow the socks off people. I want to get into that. I, you saw in the notes. I have a question about that. Um, but in terms of, you know, a, a lot of people and we guide, I guide people to, you know, rent before you buy, especially if they have questions over, you know, should I go Nikon? Should I go Canon? Should I go Fuji? Should I go Lumix or whatever? I just say go rent it and see what works with your brain first. And then buy it, you know, if you if you need to, you know, that way you, uh, you you sort of date before you sign the marriage certificate. But, you know, in, in terms of guidance for people, even if they're just renting, Drew, if they're just renting a, a new body and they're a new photographer, someone told them that they had photography chops because they saw their iPhone photos or their Instagram. Um, where would you guide them to? You know, if they're like, you know, what, I don't know what to rent. You guys have every piece of gear made by man, which I just want to take some cool pictures of, you know, insert event, you know, I'm going to Yosemite and I want to get some cool, cool pictures, some cool landscapes there. How, how would you guide them? I'd probably point them towards, uh, the Sony stuff, you know, the Sony mirrorless stuff at this point, just, uh, if you're kind of new to this, I don't know that you want something, you know, if we try to convince someone to move up from an iPhone to, you know, really getting high quality photos, you probably want to get them a kit that uh, is pretty compact. Yeah. Um, obviously with that stuff, I mean, you know, a lot of the FE lenses are just as big as DSLR, DSLR lenses, but you can kind of start at a really small form factor with those cameras. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Sony stuff at this point. It's uh all right. It's a big so, line at this point. Roger drew through the gauntlet down, see? And <laughs> <laughs> what say you, my friend? <laughs> How would you guide that new person? Well, again, if we're talking about that person who's going out for the first time, I'm probably going to steer them towards maybe a Sony or a Micro Four Thirds system because the size can get overwhelming for that person who's never shot with a DSLR. Yeah. Uh, so we get that a lot, and I, I think that uh, – if you send somebody who has been taking pictures with their phone, say a full frame SLR and a 100 millimeter zoom, they lose their mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's 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 the you know a part of it, especially since we're so used to these these tablets or these these little tiny glass devices that we carry around with us that do so much cool stuff right we can do we can take reasonably or actually very good photos with them but you're right the 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 laws of physics sort of jump in there and if you like drew was saying if you want to go to the next level and interchangeable lenses and have the reach and all that stuff then you need to go to go to a proper system but i'm wondering what that proper system is so i want to i want to talk a little bit about logistics when it comes to rentals because Part of the joy of, in my opinion, part of the joy of renting is 
not having to store that stuff, right? So you guys are storing it. You're like my giant equipment locker that I can just, you know, pull out what I need when I need it. And in fact, I think I've rented something from you guys many, many years ago. And I was doing a workshop at Yosemite, and, or not at Yosemite, at Yellowstone. And you guys shipped the lens to the hotel at the at the park so that I didn't have to carry and worry about losing or getting stolen this giant, you know, amazing lens. Roger or Drew, maybe Drew, you should should probably take this. What's the process, you know, for people that are thinking about this? You're like, you know what? I just signed up for this great trip. I'm going to X, Y, Z. I only have a couple of lenses, but I I know I'm going to need these two or three other lenses and maybe one additional body. Can they ship it to their to their destination and pick it up there or can they ship it to a local UPS store or should they have it go to their house? What are what are best practices for renting? Yeah, I definitely recommend if you are going to be somewhere, uh, if you're going to be traveling and you have access to transportation, definitely ship it either to your hotel uh, or to a FedEx location. We probably ship 20, 25 percent of our stuff um, out to people on location. Um, it's just a really good option, you know, especially with lithium ion batteries these days and check bags to just not worry about it because uh, you might get all your photo gear, you know, in your, in your uh, checked bag or your carry on bag, but then you get to the gate and there's no more room for, you know, carry on bags and you've got to now get out 19 batteries and hold them. Um, it's just a lot easier to, you know, get your rental car and drive over to the FedEx on your way to wherever you're going and pick it up there and drop it off there. And you also save yourself a little bit of money just on the rental because you won't need to get it, you know, to your house, the day before your flight uh, uh, and and carry it back with you and add another day on there. So it's a really, really highly recommended way to do it. Um, every now and then we do run into, you know, problems with hotels. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a package, a, a bellboy says he's going to drop off your package and then it never gets back to us. Um, mm. And that can be a problem. Um, you definitely want to make sure you get it to someone you trust or to FedEx um, on the return side. But it uh really does make it a lot easier for traveling to just have it there when you get there. So then, then Drew, the, 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 to piggyback on that question, what happens? Like, what, what's the liability side of the equation? Because that, that would be my, that was, that was my concern when I rented that giant lens, which was basically, you know, a car, <laughs> you know, you know, right. in terms of, you know, who, who's responsible for it? And when do I take responsibility for it? And should it be on my insurance? Do you guys have insurance that, that covers it in case of something happening, either theft or damage? Or how does that piece work? Sure. Well, we cover ourselves for during transit. So, you know, if you drop it off to FedEx and you get a receipt, um, they give you a receipt, you know, and drop it off to a staff FedEx location. If it disappears after that, it's not your problem. Same thing if it disappears before it's ever, you know, delivered to you, uh, not your problem. That's, that's unfortunately our problem. Um, and we do sell uh, waivers. Um, we, we sell a, a damage only waiver, um, which will, you know, save you if you drop the limbs that, that's something I think that every rental house does. Uh, but a few years ago, we were able to start offering uh, theft coverage for people mm. as a kind of higher end option. And that's really nice. You know, not everyone needs it. Obviously, if you're shooting pictures of your kids in your backyard, you know, if it somehow does get stolen from you, it's because your house got broken into and your homeowners will take care of it. But it's really not for when you're traveling, because um, a lot of people do, you know, get our equipment and they go overseas. The number of the number of police reports I've seen in a language I can't understand because someone got their gear stolen and was filing a claim, um, but it's overwhelming. Um, so it's really great for that. It's really cheap. It's um, a lot, lot shorter than going out and getting your own short-term policy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a that's a great option for if you think there might be a chance that somehow the gear is going to disappear. Yeah, well, there's always a chance, right? <laughs> so yeah, as long as, as long as there's humans around, you know, it, uh, there's always a chance. So I wanna, I wanna, speaking of gear, I know you guys added drones. You know, speaking of gear and, and batteries, right? You added drones to your lineup. Um, either one of you guys feel free to jump in here. How does that work? Because when I when I saw that, I was thinking. You know, I have trouble lending my drone out to people because <laughs> it may get damaged or whatever. You guys are renting out to these faceless people that, you know, that may or may not know how to even fly. How does that work? I mean, is that a loss leader? Do, you, do, you, do the drones actually come back in one piece? Uh, Roger, you want to take that? Drew probably should take that because uh, the drones were stocked over my dead body, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and actually, I have some... I, I, I started by getting one and I totally trashed it and said, we can never stock these. And then it turns out that perhaps that was more about me. 
Drew, what do, what do you say? Have they, have they been? Was it a good decision, or should you uh, should you have heeded your parental advice there? Yeah, my father uh, has difficulty being um, dispassionate about things, so <laughs> I will say that drones do crash. Uh, but if you look at the price we charge for a drone compared to its retail price, and then the price we charge for a lens compared to its retail price, it is priced as if we expect a significantly higher percentage of damage than we do with a lens. Oh. So, you know, when, when one dies, uh, it was, it was in the forecast. Um, <laughs> it's just part of it, but, uh, they're surprisingly repairable. I think, um, I think DJI has done a pretty good job of, you know, stuff like rotors, the arms that, you know, so even if someone completely clips off an arm, that's not a dead drone. Um, that's something we can fix and put a new one on there. So they're kind of a little bit modular, which helps. Um, cause if every time someone, you know, killed a rotor, it was a dead, you know, Mavic, we would be in a lot more trouble. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they are, they are damaged at times, but I think we waited this long to get into it mostly for the software. Um, the earlier generation ones, you had to know what you're doing. Um, a lot of these ones, I don't want to say all the time cause sometimes they just do crazy stuff, but the software really tries to keep you from killing it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It does a it does a really good. You have to really try most of the time to kill it, you know. Um, but sometimes it kills itself. Sometimes it just heads off to the ocean for no reason. Yeah. It just <laughs> keeps going west till it crashes. Um, but most yeah. of the time, it wants to live and it tries to keep you from killing it. So, from a, from the for the users that are watching this, they're like, you know what? Okay, maybe I'm going to rent a drone and try one to see if I want one, and then they crash it. What, how does the liability work? Do you guys take the drone or the pieces back and assess what it would cost to repair it and then charge that back to the uh, to the customer? Or do you just absorb it? Or how, do, how does that, that piece work? Well, uh, any drone customer would be wise to purchase the damage insurance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't, uh, we charge you what we get charged from the service center if it goes out to a service center. Um, if we repair something in-house, uh, we kind of give you whatever the parts in our labor was, which is usually significantly cheaper than sending it off. Um, and then if it's completely dead, you know, we're reasonable. Um, so, you know, if it's a two year old, you know, lens that we're pretty close to selling for 50% of what we paid for, uh, we're not going to say you owe us the retail price. Yeah. And if there's parts we can harvest off of it, you know, we'll, we'll credit you for those. So, okay. um, it's pretty rare for someone to just eat you know, the retail price of an item because they damaged it. Um, it probably happens a couple of times a year. But for the most part, I think people will be surprised at how reasonable a lot of repairs can be at scale. Yeah. Um, you know, the service centers work with us pretty well on pricing, and then we can do a lot of stuff ourselves. So uh, it's usually cheaper for you to break our gear than to break your own, I would say. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Well, that's a, that's, that's a good segue into how does that logic apply to regular camera bodies? So if I'm out there, Roger, and, uh, you know, I've rented, you know, the new Nikon mirrorless camera from you guys, and I drop it, you know, on concrete or in sand or in salt water or something, and it needs to go back to Nikon Professional Services for a repair, and the repairs cost X dollars or whatever, do you just pass that X dollars along to me, or do you pass the pain and anguish that you have to deal with <laughs> in assessing the repair, the shipping, the time that it's off and can't be rented, you know, does, is there some sort of magic equation? What do you, what do you say that? Well, the, the equations come from Drew's side of things, but uh, it's really surprising to most people how many things can be repaired, especially with lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, a lens broken in half, people just assume is, is gone. And really we can fix that most of the time in house. Um, Camera bodies are more difficult because there's a lot of factory proprietary software involved, so they tend to go back more. And you mentioned the uh, saltwater word. Mm -hmm. If it touches, if it touches saltwater, it's dead. The factory won't even open it. Yeah. It's as though it had a contagious disease. That's that's probably the only time people really uh, get upset with us when, because most part, the repairs are cheaper what they expect. But when they send back a camera and they say, you know, I dropped it in saltwater, but it's still working. Um, it's not going to be working in a month. So the corrosion doesn't happen instantaneous. Um, you know, a lens that got dropped in salt water might seem fine, but then a month later it literally falls apart because every piece of metal is now rusted out. Um, so we have a lot of people not accept that. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll, we'll, you can just buy it and we'll send it back to you and you can see how long it works fine. Um, 
Well, and then it falls apart on them in a month, and they understand why we said it was not salvageable. But yeah, that's a that's a good rule of thumb. So yeah, so, so salt then, water bad. Yeah, salt water bad. So or salt water. <laughs> if your camera's going into salt water, donate it to the coral reefs and <laughs> just let it let it be. Cool. Just yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is not worth going going after it. The uh, pain and suffering begins there. All right, uh, before we end the segment, uh, I want to talk a little bit about horror stories. So I know, you know, I was talking to Philip Robertson, whom you guys um, work with, and he was telling me that you guys have some pretty colorful horror stories about things that happen or have happened to gear that gets returned to you. There's things about like larvae being laid in lenses and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. So, Roger, when, let, uh, uh, let's do it in phases. Roger, when you were running things and, you know, things would come back and the, the returns department would say, hey, what should we do with this? What's some of the craziest stuff that, that you saw come back into into the shop? Uh, the bear was probably the most amazing one. Uh, <laughs> we had a customer who I remember he rented a Nikon, whatever the top end body was at the time, and I think a 4028, and was taking photos in Yellowstone. And he sent the equipment back pretty trashed and said it wasn't my fault. And here's the picture I, I took with my backup camera of the bear literally charging him, then knocking the tripod and lens over and pounding it for a while. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and he had the footage. It was, that's perfect. He had, he had another camera. Like we say, take a backup camera. So he documented it. It wasn't his fault. All right, so bear uh, attacked by bear, Co- yeah, attacking the, the by the by the Kodiak. Drew, what about you, man? What uh, what's what's the best horror story you can Ooh. dig up and share? That one's pretty good. Um, that one's always hard to top. Um, you know, mostly people take really good care of our equipment, but every now and then we get somebody who just as baffles me. Um, mostly on the video side, I would say. Um, <laughs> Uh, not because, you know, I mean, most customers treat our stuff better than their own, but, um, you know, video production especially have lots of, lots of hands involved and lots of them are $10 an hour production assistants on location that you'll never see again. Mm. Um, and some people just treat <laughs> our gear terribly and don't realize what they're doing. Uh, I just remember distinctly a conversation like three or four years ago I had, uh, we had a 500 millimeter lens come back and the front element was like nothing we'd ever seen before. I mean, it was totally ruined and they swore up and down that they did not drop the camera with the lens on it, didn't do anything. We're not going to pay for it. So I got on the phone with them um, and asked them like what they were shooting and they were shooting a commercial for the Marines out of an open helicopter in a desert. Um, and that's why the front element was that way because it had been blasted with sand for two weeks. So they didn't cover it, you know, and it just is like, how do you not see that coming? You know, just like, I mean, it was, it was like they had polished it was just it was not even that just don't like the begin whole, to cover what happened to it whole element and just you know the the obliviousness or like uh burning man every year that's a problem oh, um because yeah. there are people that just you know it's like they know they're gonna ruin something so they rent it um and that's that's exceedingly rare but that is a thing some people do is they're like i'm gonna ruin a camera this week i don't want it to be mine but then they have to pay us for ruining ours so it might as well have been theirs um yeah. So Burning Man, probably at least a couple of times a year. Uh, someone did a time lapse of a Southwest Airlines airplane. Oh, once yes. Once. And the our gear. camera came back. Everything came back covered in the paint of Southwest livery. Um, <laughs> and they had already was, posted the time lapse at that point. So it really wasn't hard to piece together what happened. <laughs> but they were like, what are you talking about? We didn't do anything with the gear. We're like, it's Southwest Colors. And he's close to the time lapse <laughs> of their pain getting plates. No, no DNA analysis necessary. Yeah, yeah. No, that one, we that we actually to had go. to sell. We had to sell a bunch of pink gear on the used arm because there was no way to get it off. And it came out, I think it was purplish, but it came out pink. And we had tripods and cameras and lenses. Cases, all pink. Jeez. Oh, you know what I, I think, you know, as... And this is this is really educational because my thinking would be, you know, I think when I think rental, I think like car rentals or whatever. So I recently went to Disneyland and we instead of rent instead of taking our own car, it took a rental car because I don't want to put all those miles on my car and drive all the way down there. You know, I'm going to put on them, put the miles in the rental. And I would think 
you know, and then, you know, you hear from other people like, hey, I got this rental. I can drive it like a madman because it's not my own car. And as long as it's not damaged or dented when I turn it in, it's totally fine. And then I'll drive like an old lady when I get my car. <laughs> right? But how does does that logic doesn't translate over? Because, Drew, you were saying people generally treat your gear better than they treat their own. Where How do you reconcile that? Like that, that whole rental methodology of thinking that hey it's not mine i can trash it versus i need to treat this good because i'm going to be charged for it if it comes back in crappy condition like, what do you think drew sure i think there's i think there's a, a line between uh you know i mean i've taken we've taken rental cars on road trips before for that same reason um, and you know a lot of people do rent our cameras specifically when they're going to be shooting really high volume you know they don't want to put five thousand shutter activations on their camera they want to do it on ours and that's fine uh, we don't have a problem with that, you know, don't take, but you wouldn't take a rental car to enter it into a demolition derby. Uh, mm -hmm. And don't do that with our equipment, you know, yeah. put the miles on it, but don't think that you can, you know, turn in a smoldering wreck and that, that you're not going to get charged for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what happens at the end? You know, so there's, I know there's a finite lifespan for gear. I don't know if you guys have a calculation for, you know, a lens can be rented X number of times before we consider it unrentable or, you know, a, a camera can have a certain number of accurate uh, or shutter presses on it before we consider it unrentable. How does that work? And what happens to that that gear that is no longer able to be put in the general rental circulation? Do you guys have a garage sale or is it Craigslist that I can go look at? How, do, how does that piece work? Sure. We uh, we retire equipment very early. Um, we just we're just kind of nuts about the way things look. Um, we want it to look new in box for people and even if we keep it up as well as we can, you know, just over time, you know, it doesn't quite look as good cosmetically, even if it's perfect. So we sell stuff off. Um, the very longest time we'll keep something is two years. Um, but we sell a ton of stuff earlier than that because it rents a lot, um, you know, and um, it's just time. But uh, we sell it all through uh, lensauthority.com, uh, which is our new sale arm. Okay. Uh, we also sell a lot of stuff directly on rentals because um, we have so many people who are trying stuff out uh, for possible purchase that, um, with one click, you know, if you if you have a you, you want to you're thinking about upgrading to a 5D4 and you rent one from us and you really like it and you're going to buy one, um, and the one you have seemed perfect to you. Um, if we've been renting that, you know, you're the tenth person that's rented that, we'll give you a price on that. That's what we would sell it for used at that you know level of use, um, and give you a credit for your rental fee. So it's a really really great way to buy equipment from us is that um, just because you know. Why, why turn back in a camera you really like to go out and buy a brand new one and spend five six hundred dollars extra when you can actually just apply that rental to the price plus get a discount based on it being used yeah yeah that makes a ton of sense especially if you've you know you've customized the camera and have it set just how you want it and you're like oh I wish I didn't have to get this back because I'm gonna go get one you can just keep it and and uh, and pay you guys for it that's that's awesome I didn't know about that um, all right, uh, we're going to close off this segment and move into the Picks of the Week segment. The Picks of the Week is is a segment where you guys get to recommend, and this is, you know, this is a strange show because normally people don't run gear rental companies <laughs> on the show, <laughs> but you guys get to recommend something to the This Week in Photo audience that uh, that would be beneficial to their photography endeavors. It could be gear, it could be a technique, a course, a t you know, a, a mindset, whatever. Um, but before we do that, Roger, you're you're the you know you're the matriarch of the, or the patriarch sorry of this uh of this of this this endeavor here i'm the old person you're, okay i was trying to dance around that but <laughs> yeah yeah i got i got where you're going there you go. so i'm gonna give you the final the parting shot on this segment if you you know what what are the last words that you leave on just sort of the whole idea of gear rentals for the this week in photo audience try something special I think there's a lot of people who look at an item and go, I'd really love to try that one time. And I think Reynolds perfect for that. Love it. Love it. Drew, you have anything to add to that? I think that's perfect, honestly. So I'll let him have the last word. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. All right. This is recorded, right? Because that's never happened before. <laughs> no, this is recorded and streamed. So it's out there. This is out in the world. Okay. Now. 
I love it. Very cool. All right, guys, let's move on to the next segment. Like I said, this is the Picks of the Week segment. This is where you guys get to recommend something to the This Week in Photo audience. Uh, it could be anything, as long as it's photography related. After this segment, we're going to dive into the listener Q&A segment. So folks that are in the chat room, if you have questions, comments, concerns, whatever that you want to throw at these guys, get your question in there. And uh, our community manager, Chris Berry, will get those out of there and put them in our Google Doc and we will answer them in the very next segment after this Picks of the Week segment. So, uh, Drew, I'm going to let you go first, man. What is your, what's your Pick of the Week? Oh, man, I wasn't prepared. Uh, but I'll <laughs> go with, I'll kind of follow up on what Roger just said, which is that, you know, try something out new that you've never done, really challenge yourself. And uh, that's a great place for rental houses. We rent a lot of stuff that um, you just honestly can't justify owning, you know, unless you're very specific in what you do. Um, you know, go out and try a tilt shift lens. Those are always fun. Um, or, or lens baby, um, never used a manual focus lens, you know, try that, just try and do something different. Um, but if I'm just thinking about like what my most favorite product, we, uh, kind of, that's kind of new to us lately. Um, if you're, if anyone, this is, this is more video related than photo, but the, uh, new, really, really tiny DJI Osmo pocket, uh, is really cool. Um, it, it's about the size of the palm of your hand. Um, it's like easier to carry than an iPhone, and it's 4K stabilized. Um, you can just stick it in your back pocket. Uh, it's really fun to just play with. I love it. That's a perfect pick. And you know why? Because Santa Claus brought me one of those <laughs> for Christmas. Yeah. And it's uh, really in my back. Right now. They're hard to find. Oh, man. I've been, uh, and I've been going crazy with uh, different mounting things for it because you know you can get the deep you get the gopro sort of mounting kit for it and stick it wherever you want so yeah it's that thing is that thing is it's borderline science fiction that's what i would say (laughs) about that thing it is it is that that cool and it's a version one so which makes it even scarier all right well cool roger what is your pick of the week it could be anything what what do you want to recommend to the twip audience i want to recommend to the twip audience that they get a prime lens and a focal length they never shoot and use it for a week and only that. Nice. Nothing I've ever done has helped my photography more than that. A prime lens and a, le- a prime lens and and what else? A body that they never shoot? No, a focal length. So oh, a focal length. Shoot, okay, got it. A focal length that they never you shoot. You tend to shoot uh, you know, portraits. Go get a wide angle prime. If you tend to shoot you know, normal stuff, go get a telephoto prime. Use that lens to shoot everything you shoot for a week. Yeah. It does a dramatic thing to your perspective and the way you photograph i love that brilliant perfect those are two good picks guys thank you thank you so much for those go out and rent the uh he wants you to rent the uh 200 millimeter f2 that's what he wants <laughs> that's the best it's i the know best. you love that lens <laughs> is that your lens roger the 300 millimeter f2 is that your uh no the- the, the 200 f2 it's the most amazing thing i've ever shot with on what which what, what? from from who canon it, it, Nikon's got one too. They're both they're both phenomenal. Wow. Um, they are just amazing, and probably the only good portraits I've ever taken in my whole life were with that lens. <laughs> why? What? What makes them amazing? Is it is it the bo- the bouquet? Is it the the sharpness? What what makes them amazing? It is that, and that aperture at that at that focal length. Uh, one of the coolest things I did I, at the time my stepson was about 10 and he wore camo everywhere and i took a picture of him three feet in front of a bunch of trees in his camo and you could hardly see him i took the 200 and i focused on him and all you saw was him clearly pictured and kind of a blur in the background three feet behind him it's amazing wow yeah i want it now i want it all right you literally have to ask yourself which eye you want to focus on it's it's that sharp it's that, that shallow it's it's awesome Wow. Yeah. It is. Life looks better at, at, uh, at shallow depth of field. I love it. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thank you both for that. Let's, uh, let's move on to our listener Q&A segment. Um, so folks that are in the chat room are posting questions. If you're watching this after the fact, after the live stream, you should have been on the live stream. <laughs> so that you can so you can ask questions. You can still go ahead and put a question in the comments for this YouTube video, but uh, it won't be answered live. Um, all right, let's jump in. The first question is from Janet Robinson, and Janet says the feature that Lens Rentals has, where you can buy gear that you're renting, is really cool. Do many photographers take you up on it and end up buying that equipment, Drew? Uh, yes, uh, fairly. 
good chunk of people do. And I think it's also sometimes interesting to see what it is they do buy compared, you know, look at what things sell the most, you know, percentage of the time they rent. Um, it really kind of tells you uh, a little bit about what maybe is unexpectedly high quality compared to what people were thinking. Um, like, for instance, uh, all of the smart lenses, especially when they first started coming out, like, maybe one out of five times we rented when someone bought it off the rental because they just, it exceeded their expectations that much. Um, and so, you know, really things that people uh, are really skeptical about buying would end up blowing them away. Those are the things that sell the most. And it's always inter interesting to see what those are. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. Thanks, Janet, for that. Uh, next question is from Ruth Happel. Ruth says, lately it seems most, most camera releases are larger cameras. Do you see a chance some future releases will go back to smaller camera bodies? And she may be talking about like Panasonic just released that new, the new system, uh, the new Lumix S system, and those are larger bodies, right? Because they're full frame sensors. Do you guys, you know, either one of you guys can take this. Do you, do you see things sort of regressing back to small? Well, I think there's definitely been the Canon and Nikon moving to mirrorless cameras, which are a little smaller. A little bit, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think all, the other part we talked about earlier has come up. There are not as many uh, or as much demand for the little bitty, what we used to call the intro level SLR cameras. Mm -hmm. So maybe that gap is widening. You go from cell phone to a bigger SLR. Yep. All right. Cool. Ruth, I hope that answered your question. Ruth has another question. She says, I've tried most macro lenses out there. Uh, which do you think are the best for extreme macro, greater than one-to-one, -one, especially uh, Sony or Panasonic, but I also use Canon, Olympus, and Pentax. Hmm. What do you guys think? With uh, the best macro for extreme macro, greater than one-one-one? One, one. The only one I really know of is the Canon MPE 65. Uh, where you can get five to one, uh, and you can certainly adapt it down to anything. That's a that's a tough world taking those kind of photographs. That takes a lot of skill. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, one of our a good friend and good friend of of this week in photo is Don Komarechka at doncom.ca, and he has planted a flag in snowflake photography, macro snowflake photography. Ah. And I mean, you know, it, it, that's all I have to say. So you can probably imagine what the work <laughs> looks like. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy stuff that that guy's doing. Um, Philip Robertson is in the house. Philip says, Roger, what is next for camera bodies? Is there something manufacturers are still missing? Hmm. What's missing? Uh, I don't know what's missing. Um, I know what I'm excited about seeing um, yeah. that, that new full frame Panasonic Sigma Leica, everybody joining in uh, camera interests me quite a bit. Um, the next generation of uh, Nikon and Canon mirrorless interests me quite a bit. Uh, I think that the first generation was just that, and I'm interested to see where they go. And then I'm interested to see how Sony responds to it too, because I doubt they're just sitting around going, "Oh well." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a cage fight now, which is which is good. We we benefit. Yeah. We consumers and photographers benefit from the cage fighting. Uh, you know, Rodan and Godzilla, these giant companies. <laughs> Uh, next question up is Janet Robinson. Janet, sa Janet says, uh, with Canon and Nikon moving into the mirrorless space, do you think this signals the eventual end of the DSLR? Hmm, Drew, what do you think? Is the DSLR days numbered? Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who have glass for DSLRs that don't want to give it up. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an investment. You know, it really is because the adapters just, you know, Whoever comes out with an adapter that works 100% of the time, um, it doesn't just randomly not work, should win a Nobel Prize. So, um, you know, until someone figures out how to reliably get, you know, adapters really, really down, I think there's always going to be people who are skeptical to change. Um, but I think you'll stop seeing a lot of the, you know, low level consumer cameras be DSLRs. I think it'll kind of be a strictly professional. Um, thing because I don't, you know, I, I know like Sony with the A9 is really going after flagship DSLRs, um, but that's a tough, tough reach um, at this point. So I think, I think they'll still be here. It'll just be kind of more at the higher end of the market. Yeah, yeah. Roger, what do you say to that? Do you do you think the uh, 
the DSLR days are numbered or or are the numbers in the mass market number and they're like like Drew says they're just going to sort of be relegated to the folks that are shooting pro I think that you'll always have, and by always I mean for 10, 15 years, uh, DSLRs released and used. Um, you know, when uh, SLRs came out, they said rangefinders are going to be dead, and there's still some rangefinders around today, 50 yeah. years later. Uh, but I think mirrorless is going to be the bulk of it, and I think it's going to be in five or six years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You know, when when just digital digital period showed up you know with like even the the like the kodak what was it or the sony mavica you remember that the floppy floppy disk based camera and kind of what was it night and uh, apple came out with the quick take looked like binoculars and shot 640 by 480 <laughs> stills i but had one of those i had one too Ooh. i had the mavica too <laughs> and and people were saying that oh that's it film is dead this is the death knell they're saying the same thing this is the death knell of film forget about it sell your film cameras digital is the future turns out digital is the future but for some reason film cameras are still sort of hanging on you know kodak is albeit swinging by a thread, but they're still around, right? And, you know, there's these niche groups that still shoot film. I wonder if that same kind of flow is going to happen with just traditional DSLRs in 10, 15 years from now, we're going to look back and some people are going to be holding on to their giant DSLRs saying, hey, this makes better pictures, you know, the same way vinyl sounds better than CDs, right? <laughs> the hipsters will be using DSLRs in 15 years for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as no one else is using them, then they'll hop onto it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm a weird person because I look at it like if you're it's the destination that matters for me. Right. It's like, you know, it, it's not. Yeah. Yes. The, the ride on the way to the destination is important. You want to get there in luxury and comfort and safety, you know, to extend the metaphor. But really, the destination is where you're going. So if if you are if, if you're like, you know what? A horse and buggy will get me from from New York City to San Francisco. <laughs> so I'm just going to use the horse and buddy buggy because it's going to get me there. When you have access to a Tesla, that's kind of a bad decision. I don't know, <laughs> you know, unless you want but some to ride. people are going to make it. Some people are going to make it because I, they're like you're going to miss half the country because you're going to be flying by, you know. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I will say this though, um, we. When I look at the different, you know, what people say they shoot on the pro side and whether they've either switched to mirrorless or considering it, uh, for pros that their clients don't see them work, they seem to be more open to moving to mirrorless. But ones where your client sees your work, a wedding photographer portrait, uh, tends to use more DSLR still. And I kind of wonder if part of it might be that, um, you know, if you, you know, you're paying five grand for a wedding photographer. Um, and they show up with a camera that, you know, a lot of the mirrorless cameras, they look like, uh, to a, to a non savvy person, what a point and shoot <laughs> used to look like what they would use. And they go, this person isn't really professional. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some clients have an expectation that if you don't come in with a hulking camera that you're not, um, you know, a real pro. And I really do think there's some people who stick with DSLRs just because that's what clients expect. And until, they're used to seeing it. Maybe it'll always stay on for that. It just looks more pro yeah, to you know, you a know, truly amateur person. It's so funny you say that because I, I was talking to uh, a couple, couple years ago, Brian Smith, uh, a friend of mine who also happens to be a Sony artisan. And he was saying that, you know, this is around around when the A7 series cameras launched you know was it three four years ago or something but he was saying that you know he shoots with a7 primarily not because he has to even though he does but he shoots with it not because he has to because but he likes it better and it creates superior images in his opinion however if he's going on set somewhere and there's the client on the set, he'll grab his bigger camera <laughs> and put it on the table with a bunch of big lenses while shooting with the little camera just so they can see that he's a real camera. So it's so theater, right? It's, it's the, you gotta be a, not only a photographer, but you gotta be a, you know, a, a, a thespian. <laughs> Sales is part of the job. <laughs> so sad it's so sad but i think that's it. attrition will fix that right because as yeah. long as yeah. younger people know that hey i can make billboard sized images with my iphone as evidenced by the apple shot on iphone you know campaign 
this giant camera doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know, so, but we come from an era with crappy images, I think, some of us, you know, maybe not you, Drew, but some of us come from, come from an era <laughs> when digital meant crappy and cell phone meant crappy, and now that's no longer true. So, yeah, I think attrition will fix all that, hopefully. Uh, Christopher Barry, hey, Chris, uh, our communi- community manager says, with events like Burning Man, dust storms, uh, drops, et cetera, are there higher rates or stricter rules for rentals? Maybe a seasonal rental fee or a location-based rental cost relative to conditions the gear is used in. Do you guys, you guys charge that? Like if somebody's, somebody's going to, you know, Florida during hurricane season, do the prices, <laughs> do the prices go up? No, I mean, it would be great if we could charge like airline prices sometimes, you know, like the more popular the destination, the more it goes up. But uh, the only time we've really ever just done something like that was with the eclipse is because we saw, you know, months in advance, people were renting gear that maybe like they they don't know enough to even rent uh, on a good day, yeah. uh, which is great. It made a lot of people who might not pick up a DSLR pick up one. But we realized kind of two months out that there's going to be a lot of people who point you know their 600 millimeter at the sky and walk away for two hours because they've got the perfect shot and they come back and it's melted so that was kind of the one time where we really reached out to people i think everyone that rented something during that three-week period got several emails from us Mm. a postcard in the box um and the fact i think we had maybe three or four things melt um but it was like the most popular week we've ever had and for only three or four things to melt was really kind of impressive honestly I mean, you'd like to see zero, but our expectation was 100, oh, wow. uh, 200, you know. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's great. It doesn't take long to point a super telephoto at the sun before it's a problem without a, you know, a, a solar filter on the front of it. Yeah. Um, Jeez, that's crazy. A, what is, a, I don't know, what, what does that do, it. Drew, what does that do to the sensor, though? I mean, if, they, if they're pointing that, that lens at, at the giant ball of, you know, plasma, does it, does it burn a hole in the sensor as well as the lens, or is, is that safe? I mean, it will for sure. And that, that was what we were worried about more than the lenses because the lenses, people could see it melted. It must be you. But uh, a sensor spot, you know, I don't think anyone's ever burned a hole in a sensor that actually said they did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who's going to say that? So, you know where we see? You get holes in sensors from concerts. Lasers will burn a hole in a sensor oh, in no time. Right. And we get that a lot. Wow. Wow. See, this is why this show is so educational. I had no idea. Um, so people out there don't point your camera <laughs> at the sun or, you know, if you're using it, if you happen to be able to smuggle it into a concert, don't let the laser get into your lens. Um, next question up is from Ruth Happel again. Ruth says, what do you think of Foveon sensors? I remember Foveon from way back in the day. They were like this, again, it was this whole Foveon sensors are the future because of the way that they're built and they're going to crush traditional sensors. And then it was just kind of, okay, now they're here and nothing big. Roger, what happened? Are are Foveon sensors still the way or are they just yet another path to a destination? They are not the way, although they're better than they were. Uh, There was a time when the Foveons really had some problems. They're different. Uh, The images look different. Using the camera's a little different. Um, they certainly haven't shoved everything else aside. Uh, so they're a niche, I think, and I think they probably will remain a niche. I know a couple of people who are massive Foveon fans. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's the big, the big deal about Foveon in a nutshell? Uh, what, what makes them unique over traditional sensors? Well, a traditional sensor has a, a bare array. So all the pixels are there and then they're covered by a film that lets either green or red or uh, blue light through. The Foveon sensor itself has three depths and senses green, red, and blue all in one sensor. Uh, That theoretically gives you three times as much image per pixel. It doesn't really work out that way, but it's more than a standard camera. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it gives you the benefit, supposedly, that every pixel is seeing its true color. Um, If you have a red filter on a pixel and there's blue light, that filter just sees nothing. So there's some theoretic advantages that are huge. In practice, what comes out is different and in some ways better and in some ways not. Yeah. Well, just like everything, right? <laughs> it's like Basically, yeah. 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 
It is. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. We'll dive deeper into that uh, in another episode with when we do our show, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Janet Robinson is up again. She says, on the subject of drone rentals, do you provide any instructions with the drones for those who haven't worked with them previously? Besides don't crash, I'm guessing, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Drew, since, since Roger is, is anti-drone, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you box up I with own a drone. drone. <laughs> anti-drone uh, rental. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we ha- we have some video content um, around it, um, but mostly our focus is on making sure you can get the app set up. Because um, if you can get the app set up and paired, um, honestly, the app will walk you through how to use the drone better than any kind of manual or thing we print could. They go. they really they really are easy to use these days. I mean, I don't know about a you know a huge one, but uh, the consumer level ones, the Mavics, the Phantoms. Uh, Super easy learning learning curve. I mean, don't don't go doing barrel rolls, you know, your first five minutes. But um, they're they're pretty easy to use. You know, they'll they'll track things for you. It, it's pretty intuitive. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty intuitive. And just to piggyback on your pick of the week, that 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 uh, DJI uh, Osmo Pocket has some of that drone technology in in it. In fact, mm-hmm. it has its own DJI app that runs it that does face recognition or face tracking. So the little head will follow faces around and it'll do sort of robotic panoramas and all that cool stuff, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I'm, I'm nerding out on this stuff. So uh, as far as your <laughs> as far as your product line offering, the rental offering on the drone side, where does it start? and Where does it end? Do you start with, say, a DJI Spark and go all the way up to an Inspire or do you, you just have a you know one or two? How does that piece work? Sure. We don't carry the Spark. Um just for us, it's it's at it's at a price point where, you know, people will just buy it and wreck their own. Um, <laughs> you know, it just and that just like, stuff that is very cheap doesn't rent well. You know, you know, like a kit lens, we carry them, but you know, there's a we can only make our prices so low because it does take a person to put it into a box and stuff like that. So things that cost a couple of hundred bucks, people don't want to rent for fifty. Yeah. Um, so we we start at the Mavic, we carry all the Mavics, and we go up. Um, through the inspires um probably gonna look at bigger ones soon uh, ones where you can actually mount a camera onto it rather than um like the zen muse inspires mm-hmm. so that 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 step up makes us nervous um you know when the camera can fall off based on uh, a user doing it wrong yeah, that's a lot some, of money there's some, yeah. <laughs> there's some things we have to think through uh, there because you know we don't want someone to rent one of our drones put a camera on it and it decapitate the mother-in-law at a wedding yeah, um, and I was going to say, how does that work? Like, <laughs> like, I mean, notwithstanding the whole idea that, yeah, there's a, you know, an, an octocopter up there with a with a, a a big camera and lens on it hovering above people, you know, with a relatively inexperienced operator <laughs> at the controls <laughs> with six hypersonic spinning blades. It's, it just sounds like a recipe for what Darwinism. Go what could go wrong? Yeah, what's a little blood here and there? You know, but... But how does that work? Is it are you guys just absolved from all liability from that once the photographer takes takes ownership of the rental? And if they if they decide, hey, you know what, I'm drunk, I'm going to fly this thing into the White House. That's on them. They're going to jail. You guys are are completely absolved of all that. How does that liability stuff work? I used to be a lawyer, so I want to just thread this a little bit. <laughs> Good. I don't really say what I want to say. Uh, but that we provide people equipment that works. Um, if they make it not work, um, I'd like to think that we don't have any responsibility. Good. Um, you know, it's it goes beyond drones. I mean, someone could, you know, not mount a lens right and they're, it drops off a roof, you know, on someone's head. Like this, things can definitely happen um, if people don't do things right. But, you know, if, if you don't mount your lens right and it falls off of a roof and it hits somebody, that person doesn't sue Canon, they sue you. Um, yeah. We're kind of in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah, or it's, it's like like renting a car. If you rent a car and you decide to run into a crowd of people, they're not going to come after the car rental company, right? It's, it's kind of it's kind of on you for being the, an idiot. Right? If the brakes don't work, if the brakes don't work, it's Hertz's fault. And we make sure we give you equipment that works um, and, and take every precaution we can to make sure you use it right. Um so, you know, like when we're looking at drones with mountable cameras, like the main thing we want to see is like how easy is it to mount something wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, 
what are the will it take off with something that's loose and might fall you know what what is that like because same type of thing we went through with underwater housings is um you know we need underwater housings where it's very obvious when it's not on there right um versus it kind of looks like it's right no no it's a slow leak like we want to rent things like things that can cause significant damage like that where you know there it's very clear when it's right and when it's not and when it potentially could cause damage so um that's the type of thing we look at with stuff like larger drones and and other things that have the potential to go disastrously wrong yeah. <laughs> also known as sideways <laughs> <laughs> all right all right there's a couple of questions left next one is from ruth happel ruth says you guys must clean a lot of camera sensors what are the best products and te- techniques for that mm. oh i'm gonna get this one all right go ahead roger <laughs> well i no longer clean camera sensors but we've got a staff that probably cleans 50 or 60 a day um <laughs> it's a lot more than that but sure there's a lot more than that and then, yeah, see, see, I'm kind of out of touch. Um, <laughs> the first thing that I would say is you don't touch the sensor until you've blown the sensor with a lot of air and got everything off of it that you can. And then there's, you know, a six day argument about wet cleaning and dry cleaning and pens and everything else. Uh, the only thing I'll say is there's a lot of, you know, Internet and YouTube information on how to do those cleanings. Uh, and if you're comfortable with it, go ahead, unless your camera has in-body image stabilization. And if it does, then I tend to uh, not use that as my learning tool on how to clean a sensor. Mm. The, the in-body stabilizers, you push a little too hard, you can break the stabilizer. And that's an expensive repair. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my, my sort of go-to rule of thumb for, for sensor cleaning, even if it's not an image-stabilized camera, is send it back <laughs> to somebody somebody that knows how to clean sensors uh or just be really careful and don't get it dirty but yeah i i don't like opening up a camera I'm, i don't even like changing lenses because that sensor is exposed you know it's just like let me get this lens on there real quick before something bad happens but uh i've never seen anybody damage a sensor with a rocket blower that that's one of those little squeeze of air things that. yeah yeah it's just that's that's easy. Not a can, a squeeze blower. Yeah, and just everybody don't fill that thing that. up with water and squeeze it in there. Just, yeah. yeah, that's not a good idea. <laughs> idea. Cool. All right, a couple more. Uh, Ruth says, "Do you feel like zooms have caught up to primes, or is it better to to have an array of primes rather than zoom lenses?" Hmm. Roger, you know you want to take it. You know you. Want to take it. <laughs> Go ahead, Roger. You know you want to take it. <laughs> Zooms cannot ever catch up to primes. It's not possible. They are closer than they used to be. And if you're f2.8 or f4, the difference isn't huge, but it's real. The difference is going to be at the edges of the image, though. So if you're shooting an f2.8 portrait, a zoom and a prime probably not any different. Uh, if you're shooting other things, though, the prime is always going to be at the same aperture, a little sharper. And none of the zooms other than a couple of sigmas are going to go wider than f2.8. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. And I, I kind of knew that because it's just physics, right? Light has to go through multiple yeah. elements and, you know, it's going to degrade the more elements it has to go through. Primes have fewer elements for the light to pass through, thus equaling a sharper image. Um, all right. Uh, but glass quality is increasing. So, <laughs> so right? absolutely. Yeah. And, and if, it, if you turn a question a little bit, today's Zoom may be as good as a prime from 10 or 15 years ago was. Interesting. Because my zooms from 10 or 15 years ago, I thought were pretty dang good. And you're saying, or my, so the zooms of today may be equal to or superior to the primes of yesteryear. That's Not, as a general thing. As yes, a general rule. That's... Okay, interesting. Yeah. interesting. There, there's some great zooms of 15 years ago, and there's yeah. some great primes. But zooms are way better than they used to be, no question. Yeah, yep. All right, last question. I think we answered this one already, but I'm gonna. I want this is actually good positioning at the end of the Q and A segment for you guys to reiterate this. Joel Figueroa says, "For those that decide to buy rented gear, is there a form of rent to own, and can one theoretically rent something until paying off the balance?" So, Drew, I think you're. I think this is all yours. Uh, well, it's a, it's a subject that is not. It's. It's uh, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> this way. When you when you traditionally think of like rent to own, you know, going down to Aaron's Rental Center and buying a t- renting a TV till you buy it. Yeah. Uh, it's 
I'm not saying the people who run Aaron's Rena Centers are the worst people on earth, but they're it's a pretty bad business practice. Yeah, yeah. To uh, charge someone fifty nine dollars a week for a full year for a five hundred dollar TV that they've now paid twenty five hundred dollars for. Yeah. Um, so we've never offered that um, for that reason, is I don't want someone to give me eight thousand dollars to own a two thousand dollar lens. But people have given us eight thousand dollars for a two thousand dollar lens, and it does become awkward at some point. Um, where it's like we've auto extended a rental for two years and they've paid for it five times. Um, so it's, it can be odd to try and not be someone who charges people five times what the value is of something. And then you accidentally do it, um, because you're unwilling to do it in the first place. Um, but we are trying to do something where at the very least, um, we can offer some financing. There's several people that do that instantaneous financing now, and that's an option going forward that we'll look at at some point this year. Um, to give you the flexibility for, you know, especially when you're buying it off your rental, if you really like the rental you have, but you weren't expecting to make this purchase for three months, um, we want you to be able to go ahead and do that. So we'll be doing something like that this year, but it will not be rent time. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll never we'll never tell you if you give us $50 a week for the rest of your life, you can own a $2,000 lens because that's just that's being an awful person i think as being as being errands basically yeah yeah we don't, we don't uh, um, do but hypothetically if if someone just to just put a full circle around it if someone rents a piece of gear and you know they're on a long-term shoot and which ends up being much longer than they expected and they have to extend the rental like you said they have to extend and extend and extend and the rental fees become exponentially higher than what it would cost to own that piece of gear do you, sure. how do you react to that do you say hey you know sure. what john doe <laughs> you now own that just go ahead and keep it or right. or do you say send it back how does that piece work it, it is easier now that we have the keeper program um because that applies a credit for your rental fees and it's either uh, it'll apply 100% of up to like your first week's rental fees, but everything after that it applies 30% of. So, if you do end up in a place where you keep renting it over and over again, you'll end up pretty, you know, you've extended it out 15 weeks, you'll have you know a really nice credit towards it, um, and eventually it will just be yours. Max. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it, love it. But don't go that way. <laughs> don't don't do that intentionally. I should say at least. Love it. All right. Well, perfect. Uh, I think that that was all of our questions for this segment. We're running over just a little bit and we're just about done, guys. Any any final thoughts before we close off the show? Roger, I'll let you go first. Final thoughts on the, those were some really great questions from the, the TWIP listeners. So um, any anything you'd like to leave them with? Not really, except I think it's a, a really exciting time to be into photography. There's some cool things that are coming. Yeah, no, absolutely. What about you, Drew? Any any final parting shots for the TWIP folks? I think what what Roger said. I think it's been a couple of it's been quiet for a little bit, and I think it, 2019 is going to be a good year for photographers. Lots of new gear, um, and stay tuned. All right, very cool. Thank you guys both for coming on the show. Fantastic to have you on. This is this is uh, like I teased at the beginning and a little bit during the show. This is the first of many because we are collaborating on a brand new Twip show, which is kind of brand new or a rebirth of our All About the Gear show, but powered by you guys, powered by LensRentals.com. Roger, you and I, or you, me, and Drew, I'm not sure of what the what the host makeup is going to be, but we're going to get on regularly uh, once we figure out what the cadence of the show is going to be, and we're going to talk about gear. And depending on when we're talking, we're going to talk about some of the trends and the chaos that you're seeing. You guys do lots of math around <laughs> what's renting and why and what's breaking and why. We're going to talk about that on the show. We're just going to dive into it. It's going to be a gear lover's paradise that that we put out there. So thank you guys for doing that. I'm really looking forward to collaborating with you on that. It's going to be fun. I'm excited about that. It's a four-hour show, right? Uh, no, we were going to make it telethon style, so 12 <laughs> hours. <laughs> so YouTube doesn't limit you on how long your shows can be, so, you know. <laughs> Uh, you get me talking about gear, we may stretch. Yeah, I love it. You know, and in, in all honesty, I've been, you know, we did it. We did all about the gear. Doug K and I hosted it for a while, and then uh, Doug went on to host it with, um, well, I can't remember his name escapes me, um, but he, Doug went on to host it with someone else, and then we just sort of shut the show down altogether. And I'll inside baseball, the main reason I shut it down was because there was no sort of seamless way to acquire gear to talk about 
you know, from a source that wasn't biased about the gear, right? So now you guys are, you know, we started talking and then just makes perfect sense because you guys are sitting in a spot where you're knowledgeable about the gear. You've rented it. It's not, it's not bullet points from a marketing executive. It's actual experience with the gear and we can actually give real actionable information to this week in photo audience. So I'm happy to bring back all about the gear with you guys. I think it's the right time. So it's going to be good. I'm excited. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Stay tuned, TWIP listeners, for that. That's coming soon. All right, guys. We are at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Once again, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode of TWIP, and that's our friends over at WPPI. Uh, you can check them out at WPPIExpo.com slash TWIP. Let me make sure I'm getting that URL right. Yes, WPPIExpo.com slash TWIP. You'll get $30 off the expo price, which costs $30. So basically, you get into the expo for free. WPPI is a sponsor of TWIP now, and I'm happy to have them on board. TWIP is firing on all cylinders, and uh, I'm excited to see that. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's wrap this show up. Where I, I have an idea that lensrentals.com may factor into this somewhere, <laughs> but give us, give us, Drew, why don't you give us the URLs where people should go to A, rent gear, B, buy gear, or learn more about, you know, the, the stuff that you guys have going on? Sure. Uh, easy thing to do is just go to lensrentals.com slash twip. Uh, we've got a code there for you, and then um, you have discount off any rental, and then if you go up to the top of that page, there'll be a link there to Lens Authority where you can go navigate uh, what we have for sale right now. Um, and if you need any help picking something out, just give us a call. We have professional photographers uh, with nothing to do all day long but talk to people who need their help. So uh, it's what they love to do. Um, they, they are, it's, it's like having Roger there, you know, to ask, answer whatever question you have. Even if you're not gonna rent something, call us up and ask us a question, we'll answer it. I love that. And thank you guys both for, like I said at the beginning, um, lensrentals.com slash TWIP for 15% off and with the code TWIP, 15, I believe it is, and that'll take 15% off uh, their rental fee, right? So why not go try something like use Roger's advice and, and try something you haven't shoot in your genre with something that you haven't shot before and, uh, you know, try it out. All right, folks, thank you both for coming on. And thanks to all the folks that joined us in the chat room. It's time for the end of this episode of This Week in Photo. Remember, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, our YouTube channel. Just search for This Week in Photo on YouTube. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, and if you're watching right now, click that thumbs up button so that people know that you like the show and that, you know, we get thumbs up. We get credit in the YouTube algorithm. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to the audio for This Week in Photo, the show is published as a video on YouTube and as an MP3 audio through our podcast, which is available on all the major podcasting platforms. So just search for This Week in Photo and you'll find us. We're on Stitcher, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Play, we're everywhere. And of course, iTunes. We're everywhere. So if you want to subscribe to us in audio and listen to us on your commute, you can do that too. All right, that's it. It is time to take that lens cap off. This is Twitter.